that if you don't have an experienced sponsor with a good management team that understands how to react to whatever it is, right? We don't know what's coming around the corner. These are businesses. These are live businesses that we have to run. And the only way we can do that is with experience. We want to make good decisions. And because of that, we've always come out of these problems or challenges, you know, well, uh, no problems with, with that at all. But that, again, if we don't have that experience, we don't know what to do, we're going to start going down rabbit holes that we really shouldn't go down as, uh, as investors and as sponsors. Welcome to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Show. Whether you are an active or passive investor, we'll teach you how to scale your real estate investing business into something big. Ken G is a former public accountant. He's also a prior owner of three Cessna pilot centers, a prior pilot. He, at one point in his life, operated a Zamboni machine and has also been a commercial lender. But all of these things naturally lead themselves all the way to being a multifamily syndicator and owner operator. Ken, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Hey, man, I love I love the diversity in the background. I mean, that's a that's a who you guys have been now in multifamily for what, 20, 23 years, 23 years. Yes, sir. That's fantastic. Well, 24. Wow. That's awesome. I love it. There's three questions I ask every guest who comes on the show. Can you very quickly tell us maybe 90 seconds or less? Where'd you start? Where are you now? And how did you get there? Yep. Started out in 1997. With my first uh, property, I bought a 28 unit apartment building uh, in a small little part of Cleveland called Shaker Square. Um, met a wonderful lady who taught me the concept of value add. Remember you said 90 seconds, so I'm going to fit it all in here. Yep. Uh, currently we, uh, we have a blind, uh, we have a blind pool uh, fund that we have just closed $13 million. We're deploying the capital right now, uh, about to get ready to raise on our second uh, fund. We've, multi we've syndicated multiple deals. How do we get there? Uh, well, my background is pretty diverse. So everything has kind of actually contributed to uh, you know, running your own decentralized business like we do. And we've just been slowly pecking away and growing uh, to, uh, to where we are now. Ken, that's fantastic. I love uh, or I look forward to digging in here further. Just audio guys real quick. We're going to take a quick pause. I don't know if you can hear it on your end, Ken. Uh, you're a hand talker and so am I. You'll see me do lots of this. When you bump the table, it comes back through as feedback as the thump uh, yeah. on the audio side. So love, lo lo love the movement because I do it too. But um, if you can try not to bump the table, then we won't get we'll thumps and thumps through the, uh, through the episode. Uh, cool. <laughs> All right. We'll, we'll jump right back in here. Uh, audio folks who are, who are editing this. So here we go. So Ken, you get, you've done so many things. One of the things you said was running a decentralized multifamily business. What does that mean? Yeah. So when you think about just running a decentralized business in itself has its own challenges. And where I learned the most about how to do that was when we owned the three Cessna pilot centers. So we were in, we we're in three separate airports mm -hmm. and we taught people to fly. We rented airplanes. We actually had a part 141 uh, pilot training program that we prepared pilots uh, all the way through to the Delta connection and got them hooked up with Delta. So, uh, but that process of learning how to operate a business that is under the scrutiny of the FAA, I mean, they inspected it us regularly and there's no room for error in the aviation world. So learning how to do that in separate locations really prepared me for what we do now. And that's we manage and own apartment buildings and they're strewn over a large geographical area. So it, you know, I became the checklist crazy person. Everybody in my company makes fun of me because I always like checklists. I like re a review process. I like redundancies. And all of that comes from aviation because as you're growing a company, you need all of those things in order to do it successfully. And although we're not dealing anymore with people that fly, right, that can kill themselves in airplanes, we're dealing with people's homes, you know, equally as important. So that's why I think it's really effective in helping us do what we do today. Let's talk a little bit about the Cessna Pilot Centers. And for those of you who are not aviators listening to this show, Cessna Pilot Centers, can you, can you tell us what they are quickly? I know you said that they teach people to fly, you give, you know, give lessons, you get people all the way through to maybe even a, a job at Delta. But what is it quickly, you know, just so they understand that? Yeah, basically it, it is a program. I don't even know if it's in effect anymore, but Cessna developed it and they developed it so that people would have a good, solid way to learn to fly. They, you know, think about it. They're here to sell airplanes, starting with single engines all the way up to citation jets. And they know once people get started, they get hooked and they're going to keep moving up. So what they knew, though, was that there needed to be a good way to teach people how to get into this, how to learn to fly. 
And so they partnered with a school out in uh, California that provided all the all the materials. But now they gave us a well-structured, well-thought-out um, video-based learning system that we could then go sell to the market. And then, of course, while we're doing that, we use new brand new Cessna airplanes to teach people to fly in. Nice. So when people had a choice, which flight school do we choose? The one flowing, flying the airplanes that are from 1950 and shag carpet? Or the one from, you know, brand new glass cockpit, wonderful experience, GPS, really hard to get lost in. Uh, you can see how people would choose because the price wasn't actually that much different. Right. right. Talk to us about the risk side of that business and why you ultimately exited that and then compare that to what you guys do in multifamily. Yeah, the good good question. So the risk side of the of the aviation business is the challenge, and that um, you know even though we were super careful about all of our processes and everything else, one of the things that really made me change my mind about that business was one. I think it was Christmas Eve or the day after Christmas uh, one year. We had a seventeen hundred hour military pilot. He's a flight instructor with us. I mean, extremely extremely qualified, flown in all sorts of military operations. But he almost killed himself landing a Cessna 172 at a small airport in Akron, Canton, flying it for maintenance. There was nothing wrong with the airplane. But when he did that, I realized, wait a minute, that I, there is nothing that I could have done here that could have changed that outcome. Right. He didn't kill himself. I mean, he he crashed and, and the plane was fine after about fifty thousand dollars in repairs and he wasn't hurt. But, you know, after that experience, I thought, well, I don't know that I can really manage this risk. I can't now draw that parallel to our business. What we do today, I mean, we're managing people's homes. So what it does is it keeps me hyper focused on life safety issues, making sure that we have processes in place, because most of the risks in running an apartment building are are preventable and, and manageable if you just have systems and processes in place to identify them and mitigate them. Uh, so that that's kind of the comparison in the aviation world. I sold the company because I just couldn't get comfortable managing that risk. In our world, I can get pretty comfortable managing the risk. What are some of the risks that you see, you know, maybe that you guys mitigate with proper procedures and checklists that, um, you know, maybe you see some other operators not really accounting for? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So there's a lot of things. Uh, the, the most important risk that people have in the apartment world is that is that uh, tenants will fall asleep and uh, leave something on the stove and there's kitchen fires. I mean, that is a more common experience than you, you, I, you know, I care to admit. Right. But there's products out there that will automatically detect that fire and automatically put it out <laughs> before anybody even knows what's going on. Right. We have smoke detectors, but do every, you know, can I be assured that every resident isn't going to somehow disable that smoke detector? I can't, but some of these products that are available now, I can, I can mitigate that risk. The other thing we do is we put a fire extinguisher in every kitchen, right? Because the number one thing people do when they do have a kitchen fire is they panic, right? Well, the fire extinguisher is literally right behind them and they just put out the fire and, and life goes on. So we just look at every little risk like that, figure out what it's going to take to mitigate it. And we put it in place. That's fabulous. What is the product? Uh, you know, just if our listeners listen to this going, Hey, you know, we own a couple thousand units and we don't have that in our kitchens. What is the product that you Yeah, sell? I don't, I don't know what the exact name of it is. It's a fire suppression system that you can get from Chadwell supply or HD supply or any number of, I, I just don't remember the exact name of it, but it's a fire suppression system and it's not ridiculously expensive. Right. Right. And I wonder even on the insurance side, you know, if you can present that to your insurer and say, Hey, look, all of our kitchens are equipped with this product. Yeah, we, we do. We do tell them, um, you, you know, I'm not the one negotiating directly with the underwriter. Our agent is, so I don't know how much uh, benefit they really give us. Um, but uh, you're right. It is, it is definitely uh, something, something to consider doing. Yeah, absolutely. How long have you guys been raising money from private investors? Ooh, good question. I think our first raise was 2004, maybe. Okay. Yeah, I think that I think that was the first raise. It was a small right. property in Cleveland, Ohio. Right. Okay. Okay. So 2004. I'm sure you've learned some lessons along the way. Let's talk about this from two perspectives. Let's talk about it first from the passive investor side. What are some things that you feel like passive investors should know before they give you or anyone else money? Yeah, that's a loaded question because I spend a lot. Of, I, I, I have very strong feelings about this. And that is the number one thing I want passive investors to do is to vet their sponsors 
and make sure they have experience. This, I, I can't underestimate this. And I know it seems kind of obvious, but you'd be shocked. There are people out there raising money and millions of dollars who have never actually bought and sold an apartment complex and made money. Right. And I just, I don't want to see passive investors take that risk. I mean, you know, somebody has to start somewhere, right? But, you know, do that with your friend, your buddy, your, your family, something like that. You know, let them cut, cut their teeth on their family. But passive investors need to make sure that their sponsors have experience because look at the pandemic that we thought we were coming out of. We're still in, I mean, look at the recession of 07, 08, 09, 2010. Those are, these are real big events that if you don't have an experienced sponsor with a good management team that understands how to react to whatever it is, right? We don't know what's coming around the corner. These are businesses. These are live businesses that we have to run and the only way we can do that is with experience. We want to make good decisions. And because of that, we've always come out of these problems or challenges, you know, well, uh, no problems with, with that at all. But that, again, if we don't have that experience, we don't know what to do, we're going to start going down rabbit holes that we really shouldn't go down as, uh, as investors and as sponsors. How do you, you know, I do see that. I see that a lot in, uh, in sponsorship teams that are an amalgamation of people that I know either are really, really, um, you know, new to the business and you see eight, 10 general partners on it. And it's, and it's just kind of, they're all, it's a, it's a quilt work of, of people raising money and doing various parts of the process to actually get the deal done. And that gives me great concern you know, when I look at that, I mean, I go, wow. I mean, I might know some of you, but I, I'm not investing. I personally won't invest with you. I just can't. Um, not, not just because I don't like the, the, the deal or the, or not the deal. I don't like the deal. I don't like the team makeup, if you will. How do you uh, feel, how do you feel though, about when someone goes out and brings on a, you know, a third party mentor or someone in the space, they say, Hey, look, this is somebody I'm working closely alongside. I've paid them a lot of money. I'm, I have their cell phone number. We connect and they are joining this deal with me. Do you think that adds any credence to the deal or is it still just that, hey, buyer beware? No, it, it, it does. It does add credence to the deal. I prefer that whoever that coach, that person that you're working with has a little bit of money in your deal, mm -hmm. their own money, because now I know they're gonna be more interested than if they have none. Uh, but anything that you can do to get experience on your side is a really good idea. I, I completely agree with that 100%. I like, I like that statement there. Does your coach or your mentor have money in the deal? But that, that, that flies directly in the face of the, of the, what I call the go rue, but no do person that, uh, and, and I'm, I am opposed to that. I'll just say it here on the show flat, flat out. If you're coaching, but not doing, I, I probably don't have any interest in what you're doing. So, um, you know, that's uh, that's really interesting. Does your coach have money in the deal? So I think that's another great, a great talking point. Uh, if you're listening to this and you're scaling, to really take that home. If you have a mentor, Hey, are they investing in your deals as you guys go live? Uh, not just maybe signing on the loan, but also putting hard cash of their own in the deal. So that's, that's really, really cool. Talk to us uh, when it comes to steps that we must follow. Like uh, you guys have your checklist, you love your checklist. And uh, one of those things is, is uh, you know, when you're renovating a property, you guys have kind of developed some steps and checklists for that process and things we must know. What are those? Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, we, again, that's a, that's a loaded question because um, I, I feel pretty important or pretty uh, uh, strongly about this. So the, the first, I would say three things has nothing to do with renovations. And that is the first thing I want you to do is to do a true in-depth market study. Don't just back of the napkin it. Don't just look at the broker's OM, get in your car, drive around, figure out what the neighboring properties are. And so you want to do a good rent study. I, I start with Google driving. That's what I call it. Google driving the, the, the market. And then I'll get in my car and, and actually do it before I buy the property. But you're putting properties into three buckets, top tier, middle tier, lower tier. Where's your property at now? When you're going to renovate, where's that property going to compete when you're done? And how does it look in both of those scenarios? And make sure that it makes sense. Imagine you're a renter trying to figure out where to live and you're projecting a certain rent amount, will you feel it's appropriate given the competition that's out there after you're done renovating? So that's step one. And people don't like to do that. They like to delegate it to their management company. Don't do that. Do it yourself. Your management company is not the one that's talking to your investors. You are. So make sure you do it yourself. That's important to me. Second thing is figure out your budget and don't be afraid 
to modify that budget. I see a lot of new people in this business. They tell their investors up front, they're going to do A, B, C, X, Y, Z. And then when they get into the deal, they stick to that plan no matter what. And here's what I'll tell you. We ran it, we change our plan repeatedly through the process. I have one plan when I first tour it, uh, an LOI. I have another plan after DD. I have another plan after close. And this leads me to my next point. I want you to wait 30, 60, 90 days, some amount of time. I want you to sit on your hands, resist the urge to go spend all your renovation money on day one. Don't do it because I want you to get to know your property hmm. because you need another iteration on your renovation plan. Because do you think that sellers tell you absolutely everything that there is to know about their property before you buy it? Of course. Probably not. There is probably even things that the seller didn't know about the property that you're going to learn. So what you don't want to do is spend your renovation budget, then figure out, uh oh, I just learned something about this property that I'm now to have to deal with and I don't have any money left. So now I got to go back to my investors and ask for more money. And that is not a good situation. So that's the first three things I want you to do. Then I want you to renovate from the outside in right? Think this is not hard, right? Curb appeal. Jerry Maguire, you had me at hello. Think about how a renter approaches your property. Signage, curb appeal. Then they go to the clubhouse, the leasing office, your amenity package. Make that really dynamite, right? Wow them before you even have to get them to the apartment. Right. Then go into the apartment and just don't let them down in the apartment. So many times I see people do the other way around. Mm -hmm. People live in their apartment. That's where I'm going to spend my money. Why would I want people don't care about the pool? Oh, yes, they do. Right. Because if I can't get them from the curb behind that locked door where all your money is hidden, then it serves no purpose. So outside in seems kind of obvious, but I see a lot of people making that mistake. And the last thing I, I, I'll talk about, and I talked about this before, don't be afraid to reassess your plan. See, that's an experience issue. New people. I have clients that do this. No, no, no. I told my investors on day one, I was doing X, Y, and Z, and I'm going to do it come hell or high water. I said, but the situation has changed. Don't you think you should change? I don't want my investors to think they don't know what I'm doing is their typical response. No, your investors understand that you're in a dynamic environment and you should change. And we prepare our investors. This is what we think we're going to do. And for the most part, we do do it, but we're tweaking it here and there because it's our job to make the best decision every single time we make a decision and use their capital as wisely as we can. And framing that. it. Yeah. Framing it to that, to, from that perspective to your investors really helps that kind of conversation go a lot more easily. Have there been some times where you learned this lesson the hard way? Yeah, I mean, one, I can't remember the deal, but you know, a long time ago, I had a deal where I did exactly what I talked about. I went, I didn't sit on my hands. I was excited to go in there and get it done and do it. And then I realized, uh, uh oh, I, I learned something about the property. I've got to fix this. And now I have it's it just was harder to do that because the money was gone. Right. I'd already spent it all. So, you know, the, some of these lessons that I talk about, they're personal experience lessons, which is why I go back to my risk, my advice to passive investors to make sure your sponsor has experience. He or she is going to make mistakes. They, I mean, we'll make mistakes in the future. We're not going to be perfect. Nobody is. But you want the big ones out of the way before your money gets into the deal. That's how I look at it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you've got 24 years in the business. You've seen a lot of things change here in the multifamily industry. Where do you feel like we are now and where does multifamily go in the future? Yeah, I, I am extremely bullish on multifamily. I mean, generally we're in the growth markets. Um, I could have a different conversation if we were in a non-growth market, but the growth markets, you know, there's so many reasons why we buy in central and northern Florida and in the southeast and and soon probably in the southwest, like Texas and places like that. But it's demand supply. And you in order for this multifamily world, think about this. Everybody needs a place to live. Right. right. Can you find a case scenario where office space might not be in this high demand? Yes, sure. you can. How about retail? Sure. How about self-storage? How about just name, you can name any asset class and you can find some way to really kind of erode the demand for that product. But it's really hard to figure out how that's going to happen both a family unless we all figure out how to not need a place to live. And I don't think that's going to happen. So we're, so now 
you want to, I, I can't, I, that's the safest asset that I can find in the real estate world. So now I go to markets where people want to live. People are moving to states like, like Florida, like the Carolinas, like Texas. So we have a demand picture that I don't see changing anytime soon. Right. I, I just don't see it happening unless something, for example, in Florida, suddenly they enact a big uh, you know, statewide income tax. I mean, that'll throw everyone for a loop and it might reverse the train, but I don't see that happening. Plus there's all sorts of other reasons people wanna live in Florida. And it's not just a retirement community anymore. It's just not at all. So, so now that's the demand side. On the supply side, think about this. We do BC class assets. We don't buy the brand new stuff. So when you have increasing demand and a BC class asset that they can't build right now because they can't afford to, and they've never been able to afford BC class assets, you have a demand supply situation that is very much in your favor for increased rents. And you've got to show me how one of those two things is going to break down before I uh, change my mind about multifamily real estate. Right. Right. I love that. I love that. Ken, thanks for, for pulling back the curtains on that and kind of giving us your thought process behind multifamily, where it's headed. You've given us lots of things to think about here today and certainly appreciate your time and coming on the show. Let's jump here into the final four questions. The first one is this, what is one digital tool or resource you find you cannot live without? Oh, geez. Uh, well, some of the uh, market uh, um, technologies out there, Yardi, CoStar, uh, we, I use that constantly, uh, not as the end all in my rent survey, but as a way to learn as much information about a particular area, property, submarket, neighborhood as I can. Right. That's fantastic. If you could help our listeners avoid just one mistake in real estate, what would it be and how would you avoid it? Um, yeah, owner, operator, or a passive investor? Either one, you pick. Passive investor, stick with experience. Owner, operator, do your homework. Don't delegate any of it. Make sure you understand the deal. Roll up your sleeves and get your hands dirty and figure out what's really going on on the market. Right. I love that. Question number three, when it comes to investing in the world, what's one thing you're doing right now to make the world a better place? Well, we're just generating really nice places for ordinary people to live. I, I, that's, I'm really proud that we do that. And I think we do a really good job of that. That's fantastic. Ken, if our listeners want to get in touch with you or learn more about you and your company, what is the best way to do that? Yep. So kripartners.com slash ebook. My ebook, uh, I wrote it myself. Multifamily real estate is a total game changer. Addresses two questions. Well, the first question everybody faces before they get in this business, and that is they know everybody's making a ton of money in real estate. They just have to figure out how they're going to get, how does that fit into their life? How does it work for them? So I take you through that process. Most people should probably become passive investors. So as I said, I was pretty, pretty big on this topic. How to vet sponsors is the second part of this book, because I think it's really, really important that you get with the right sponsors, because if you do, you'll make a lot of money. If you don't, you're, you're going to have a bad experience with it. And I don't want you to do that. So KRIpartners.com slash ebook. It's a free download. Uh, doesn't cost you anything except your email address. And then, uh, then you get to hear from me every now and then. Ken, thank you for your time today. I do appreciate it. You bet. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for listening to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Podcast. If you can do me a favor and subscribe and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, whatever platform it is you use to listen, if you can do that for us, that would be a fantastic help to the show. It helps us both attract new listeners as well as rank higher on those directories. So appreciate you listening. Thanks so much and hope to catch you on the next episode.